<clears throat> Let me introduce the next uh, presenter. Uh, she come, came all the way from Australia to participate in the conference. Uh, and a very, uh, the, the title of the presentation is very intriguing, People, Power in the 8 plus B Transition by uh, uh, Professor Peter Ashford from the University of Queensland. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to throw out there if you heard the term, just, you know, you can do this reflectively, energy literacy. I just want you to think about that um, and what it means. I've been working as a sociologist for many... Oh, I just asked. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes? Yeah? You can hear me. I don't know. Is that okay? Yeah? All right. I'll talk a bit louder. Is that okay for you? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So what I would say is just, yeah, to think about what energy literacy is. As a social scientist who's worked a lot with a whole lot of engineers and so forth, um, I actually think the people component can be quite important. And I was actually coming over for a conference in Arizona next week and I saw this was on and I thought it was interesting to try and put in. So I guess this is the title of my talk. So people power in this A plus B transition, so don't forget the, the human component. So what are the things, um, and I also want to acknowledge actually um, Pro Associate Professor Ma Lin Wei from Tsinghua University. I take students from Australia across to China to look at what they're doing. And Ma Lin um, is an engineer but has been doing a lot of systems analysis and through our collaborations and, and his experiences, he's starting to recognise the role of you know, actually understanding governance, people and all those sorts of things within the system. So um, we've sort of brought together a few ideas in this. And so one of the things that sort of my takeaways is that we need to adopt a systems approach and I've heard that a lot throughout these two days so I don't think that anyone disputes that. Um, we need to understand the role of technologies, both new and emerging, and what their potential is, which again, we've seen a lot of that being modelled and explained over the last two days. But I think also we've got to think about the governance structures that surround that and think about what the role of the public opposition and support and engagement and uptake is in, in influencing how that will operate within the system. And I guess one of the components that I'm really interested in is how do we build energy literacy to try and, and to, help that, um, to help people make more informed decisions. So this is a paper and I'm sort of drawing on little bits of people from around the, from around the world. So this is um, work that Lin Wei sort of uh, led with his colleagues when he's thinking around this idea for systems approach. Probably nothing really different about the input outputs if we're aiming for a sustainable output. But I guess this idea of the decision making is really critical and who makes those decisions. Um, Obviously, within the energy, we've got the market operator and market operation, and then energy systems, which tends to be the technology, I suppose. And so that interplay between each of those is, is sort of what we think is really important. So including the people within that system is actually really important, but often hard to model. But we need to be aware of it. Some other really fantastic work, which I draw on a lot and have applied, is this work from um, some Dutch researchers Hoyts, um, Mollen and Steg. And what this does, it actually looks at the things that influence people's acceptance. And we've actually applied this to people's response to nuclear, to battery storage, to a whole range of different technologies and it does hold up. I won't go into great detail, but on the outside of this we know that people's knowledge and experience, what they bring to the situation, where they've been brought up, all of those things will influence whether they will accept a technology or their views. Um, trust is critical and two elements around procedural fairness and distributive fairness. So is the process for delivering new technology or new systems, is it fair and how will those benefits be distributed across, across the system? Along the, the blue there, we've got things like positive and negative effect. Does it make you feel good or does it make you feel bad? You know, is there a good feeling about this technology or does it bring some concerns? What are the perceived costs, risks and benefits? Because each of those will weigh out how people think about this technology and will influence their attitude. Also up there, we've got things like social norms. So what do your friends and family think? 
what's going on? What do leaders, do they think this is a good technology? All of these things start to influence um, ultimate acceptance or intention to acceptance. The other things down the bottom, things like um, how big a problem do we think we are trying to deal with? And how much do we think that we can actually control or have some um, influence in that outcome? So I just wanted to share this. I would encourage you, these are just some ideas, I think, to go away and have a look. Um, but one of the things that uh, has really interested me is this idea of energy literacy. Because what I see, and you probably would have heard the Australian election and our outcome hasn't been so favourable for dealing with climate going forward based on who's been re-elected. Um, and so I've sort of, for the last 15 years, been thinking around when we work with this, well, how do we build people's knowledge and understanding to be able to make decisions at that point? So do I invest in a rooftop solar PV? Do I allow a wind farm to go? Should we have radioactive waste to allow, you know, all these different things. And actually, I think there is this idea. And so there's been some research, but there's not a great deal that really looks at this concept of what energy literacy is. So, and my sort of thinking was, we're also really bad at financial literacy. We're not so good at health literacy. And so with some colleagues, whoops, there goes my laptop. Just leave it on the ground, spine. fine. Yeah, then it won't fall. Um, is if we could find a framework that works, could we actually apply it in all of these areas? Because in Australia, people's superannuation is not looking good for the longer term. We need to build literacy in all these areas. So we know if we started to look, obviously there's a cognitive co component to it, so knowledge and skills. The effective, which is just what we heard there, so attitudes, values, what's your personal responsibility? And also your behavioural elements. What do people actually do? And actually, there is this fabulous um, thing that's been put up that we found when we were looking around by the US government, which actually goes into some detail and some researchers, which we connected here, that have been looking at that. But we ran a whole lot of interviews with different people working in the energy space and also sort of did a bit of a survey. And so we came up with this definition with a, an energy literacy literate person is someone with the appropriate level of knowledge which empowers them to make informed, rational energy decisions and actions which have a positive outcome for the individual and ultimately society at large. Now there's all these debates about people don't make rational decisions, they make values based, they make emotional ones, but at the same time I'm very hopeful that I think we can't give up on actually trying to arm people with the tools that they need to make these decisions. In actual fact, when we looked around, you won't be able to read this in great detail, but this was some work done um, actually testing energy literacy at the schools level. And it talks about things like, I can hardly read it because I'm getting old, you know, actual understanding of scientific basics is one of the first things. Do you understand issues related to energy? How aware are you? What's your own self-assessment? So there's quite some practical things which actually sort of tie over a little bit to that technology acceptance model that we talked about before. And so this, I'm sort of interested to actually think going forward, how much does this actually apply more broadly? And if we actually really made concerted efforts to build literacy across society, could we retest this and see that it starts to make a difference? So now what I'm going to quickly do is just give you some examples of, I suppose, where perhaps the people part maybe could have considered better. And I'm just going to draw on a couple of case studies and I'm happy, I won't go into great detail, but this is a sort of fairly recent map of solar penetration in Australia. It has been a high uptake. I think we're up to about 11 gigawatts now of installed capacity. But what happened, and I guess this gets to sort of the economic modelling and policy ideas. Most people, when we survey around Australia, around the world, love renewable energy. They think it's a great thing, but what we see is that they don't necessarily always want to pay for it. And so early on, um, there was a couple of policies. So I'm going to talk about federal and also what happened at the state. So we have these different levels of governance. And if you think back to the model about decision making and governance. So originally, um, in 2000, we had what was called a photovoltaic rebate scheme. And um, it was quite generous, $4,000 for every installation of a 1.5 kilowatt on the roof. And guess what? It was oversubscribed. People loved it. 2007, change of government. 
So it was no longer called the rebate scheme, but it became the Solar Homes and Community Program. And they offered $8,000 to install. And guess what? Oversubscribed. People loved it. And so then it was like this, oh, oh dear. Actually, this is costing us quite a lot of money. So then they brought in a means test where anyone um, under $100,000 could subscribe, but actually it continued to increase, and so in the end, it was discontinued. We also early on had the mandatory renewable energy target, which way back, I'm sad to say, in 2001 was 2%. Um, and they sort of introduced this renewable energy certificate and worked out the value of how much carbon would be abated over the 10 years, did a calculation and came up with it was about $1,000. So that was also an opportunity that when you installed, you could actually get $1,000 if you gave away your renewable energy certificate. Um, that changed again in 2009, and they came up with this, when they increased the renewable energy target to be 20% by 2020, the calculation increased, and they gave away a solar credits multiplier for your renewable energy certificates of $5,000. So it was paid up out the front for the lifetime of the solar. Okay, thank you. Um, but I think what we found, and, and Tim Nelson and Paul Sinshaus are sort of very famous Australian economists, and I'd recommend the paper to you, is that what happened was with this is that the cost of the program moved from the budget to actually be cost to, a cost to all consumers. And so when they started to look at that alongside the state um, feeding tariffs, it really had sort of probably a negative effect on certain households. So what we had across the states, I won't go into detail, is a range, and you can see them here, of feed-in tariff incentives. Some were gross, so you got paid for everything that you produce. Some were net, and they ranged. I think at the stage when these were first introduced, the cost was probably for a kilowatt hour, was a, we used to pay a retail was about 18 or 19 cents. It's now gone up to 24, 25. And so these were offered, and once again, the uptake was way over what people had expected or the government had factored in. And so when um, Paul and Tim were doing an analysis of this, um, they actually looked at, there was uh, three million households and they were all sort of spread across different um, income brackets. That when you actually did a weight of average cost of the whole um, cost of the program and then shared it between each of the households, what you actually found is with this being applied, it was the people that could least afford it that were actually probably being, having this regressive tax in the way that it was because it came out of budget and then into be shared across all consumers. So an unintended consequence of not factoring in the uptake had a huge impact, not only on individuals, but also on the overall cost. So let's have a quick look at China and I'm gonna focus up in the corner of Turpan, all right? where it was the first microgrid project that was introduced in China. And if we recall the system, um, and again, I would recommend the source of this, so I'm just taking these examples to sort of highlight, I suppose, the physical system, you've got the technical thing, you've got the characteristics of power generation and consumption and how it's allocated. You've got policies, again, both nationally and then what happens at the local ground and then the, how the market operates. So this went on and this gives you a little bit of an idea. So they, the, with the microgrid putting PV on about 300 homes, a little bit less than that. Um, there was power switching outside of the microgrid, of course, there was connection to utility. There was about 1,000 kilowatts of, no, of batteries put in as well for some um, and so forth. So that, there is your little system. But what happened if you look is the red is the total power consumption. And there's a bit of a, bit of a gap, so of course they had to draw on the utility. Um, this Sankey diagram, I suppose, explains it quite well. Um, and the thing that wasn't taken in, which was caused those large power, was the, the use of these ground source heat pumps. But the big issue was actually how that paid out for costing. Because in factual fact, the hope was that they would only ever take up to 50% from the utility, but it ended up being 80% had to come from the utility. So overall, looking at the rough costs, it just wasn't viable in that way. Um, so 
the paper goes into great detail. We haven't got time for it here, and I'm happy to share it with you, but how those are allocated and actually, so if you're going to try and make this a sustainable microgrid projects across China, a lot more needed to be done in the decision making around the policy and how they share the benefits of that. Um, yeah, so really I hear I'm just looking at bottom line. So what does that mean? Okay. So I think for me, having worked and run workshops and focus groups is that we need to raise awareness and there's multiple ways of doing this. I think one of the confusing things for general public consumers at all different levels is how do we decide? And we often have academics who have certain interests around different technologies and theirs is the answer to this big issue we call climate change. But what happens is when Professor A and Professor B get up and talk about their technologies, and they're actually in diametrically opposed, the people go, well, how do I decide? And in actual fact, when I was at CSIRO, one of the public, CSIRO is the national research organisation. It's probably the most trusted in Australia. They said, Peter, we trust CSIRO. Can't you tell us what we have to do? But not everybody wants to read a book. So there's this idea we've got to have multiple ways, you know, po podcasts, futures forums. How do we bring this work together? One of the things we looked at doing was something called Energy Mark, where we use CSIRO and an expert group of um, scientists, but also people working in the, across the energy sector. So someone working for NGO, someone working for coal. So diametrically opposed views, but they came up with the information that we shared. It was also based on the fact that people trusted CSIRO and they trusted friends and family. So we actually got people within these convener groups to nominate to actually host these discussions. And basically over a period of a year, they would convene little groups and we'd share the information and have different discussions. And what we actually saw was that over time, we got people to set goals um, and monitor their sort of consumption over time and we did see a reduction. Now it's very energy intensive, as in resource intensive people wise, but we actually saw over time people became more, um, more literate and more able to participate. So I guess this was just really a start to get thinking around at a very technology conference and things is, yes, we need systems, we need to understand the role of technologies, positive and negative, but we can't forget the governance and how we can influence policy makers and politicians, but also public. And then I think energy literacy is something that we could perhaps think about. And we've just recently re released that report. And anyone that's interested, I think there's a real lot of opportunity to start testing some of this more broadly. So thank you. Questions? Yeah, let's start there. Hi, I'm so excited. This is great. Uh, this addresses, I think, one of the most critical problems. And I mean, you know, I think we should all be aware of as we discuss the different technologies that we think can make a difference. So you focused on people, household. How do you think you could make, uh, use this type of approach to help politicians and the larger public understand more about our energy system as a whole? Because I'm in DC right now, and I have people, you know, I'm helping, like, well, you know, can't, do politicians really understand the portfolio? Are they here? Like, what are they hearing? And of course, that comes from people. So I have a process for the colleagues. I'm happy to share that. Colleagues at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology said that they had to do energy counselling 101. So when they started this transition with the energy vendor, the politicians would come to them and Reinhardt would say, sit down and let me talk to you. you know, so there's a lot of engagement, I think, at different levels, but there are processes that you can actually bring together where you, you bring those facts and, and because you've got to trust a group of experts that come from different, different opinions and they sign off on it. So it's based on the science that actually builds that credibility and trust. And I actually think opening up sometimes and having some bipartisan discussions, you know, some Chatham House rules, or maybe you have to separate it, I'm not sure. And maybe it's actually the political advisors, because often they're more influential sometimes, getting to those key people across the board. But you've got to invest time to do it. Do you think the like the, the kind of wedge approach? Yeah. The I'm sure other people have questions, but I thought that was really fantastic. Thank you. Really Thank you. I mean, you, you start to get this regarding academics. I, I'd say I have a huge version of what you were getting at happened recently where I, I went to this conference on sort of carbon capture. And I'd say no less than five different people sort of solved climate change and that they, they told the audience that 
but not in those exact terms. Mm -hmm. And then I think part of the challenge is that um, there wasn't almost, and not that I want things to be contentious, but there, there almost wasn't enough genuine yeah. discussion about whether or not those were real solutions and what might have been lacking in them. And then if the academics aren't even managing to do it, then, then how can we expect you know, the politicians or the public? So I, do you have a sense that some of what you've seen is filtering from a well, lot to the top in that respect? I, I actually, well, this is my worry, and I guess you know, you, our election last week was a, a classic example. So what you're talking about there, I see it all the time. I go to a lot of carbon capture and storage conferences, this group think that happens. You all, um, there's a whole psychology theory about it. You actually identify with people, you seek people out with similar views, and you've got to create the dissonance and challenge those sorts of things. So um, there are ways to do it, but I think we've got, to, we've got to be constantly challenging ourselves. One of the things that I think we're the, in just this recent is that we can't make people feel guilty about the whole idea of climate. That's not going to help. So the messaging, I think, is really important about how we do engage. And I think our role as scientists is to share the knowledge that we have in the most what's the word, agnostic way as we can to help people then reflect. And what you'll find is that in group processes, they'll listen to one another who will actually challenge their assumptions. It creates a bit of dissonance, and then you actually get movement. And so that energy mark is exactly what we, we saw happen. So you can do it at small scale and you can do it at large scale. But you've got to give people safe places to be able to do that. And sometimes you can do it online through focus groups. And, so, and I've been thinking about this idea of podcasts and so forth. Even the diatribe that actually goes on after that, it's probably okay that people will respond negatively and things, but at least it's getting society talking about it in a way that's challenging them to think about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.